performance end of the spectrum, we have languages like C and C++. And I'll call these the are you serious block because basically no one would ever choose these to build a real world application because the programmer productivity is so bad. At the high level end of the spectrum, we have popular scripting languages like JavaScript and Ruby and Python. And I'll call these the better buy a few more servers block because we know that these languages have such bad performance that you might want to think twice about using them for that reason. But how bad is the performance? To help us answer that question, we have a performance comparisons of web frameworks. For instance, the one I've linked to here, the URL at the top of this slide. This one's run by a company called Tech Empower that does some pretty serious performance testing of many different web frameworks. And they have a, a few different servers running in one data center connected with fast networking. And there's a, a simulated client's machine that's going to launch many processes pretending to be browsers asking for web pages. And those requests get sent to the server, which is running whichever framework we're testing. And it's also dispatching some requests to a database server. For our purposes, what matters here is that each of these machines has the capability to run 40 software threads at once at the hardware level. And if a framework fails to take advantage of concurrency scaling effectively, then it will be at a big disadvantage. So we can use a test like this to see what is the real cost of picking different languages. So we might consider choosing a framework like Node.js, one of the, the popular ones today, that makes it possible to build a complete web application, including the server side, just using JavaScript code. And one of the big advantages of Node.js is illustrated by this graph. Here's the hype meter. <laughs> and so if, if you want a good thing to talk about at parties in Silicon Valley, then you should definitely learn all about Node.js. But my talk is about a different high-level language, and it's called Urweb. It's a DSL that I've been working on for almost 10 years. It's a purely functional language. It has a very rich type system that is inspired by dependent types and looks a lot like Calk and Agda in many ways. From Haskell, it takes monads and type classes. And from the ML languages, it takes its module system. And the program on the screen here is the source code for the Urweb implementation of one of the tests used in that performance comparison. I'll highlight a few other parts that get to the domain-specific angle. We have parsing and type checking of SQL code at compile time, much like we saw in the previous talk. Uh, we have similar stuff for parsing and type checking HTML code. And here you can see a function that is computing an HTML tree as a pure value that's being returned as the result of a page generation process. And we have the usual things you expect from functional languages like many higher order polymorphic functions to help us write shorter code. So all of these are features that I think many programmers would worry would compromise the performance of the code that we write. So let's look at the programmer productivity end of this comparison. We might look at the reference manuals of, of the different frameworks that we're considering. Here's one peek inside the manual for Node.js. It's a very reasonable explanation of how you parse a URL into its pieces. Let's also take a look at the manual for Urweb. I'll open it up and pick a page at random, and we might see something like this, a bunch of typing rules. <laughs> I know from my email inbox that a lot of programmers out there don't appreciate this kind of thing. And they conclude immediately, this is not a practical language. So I don't know about you, but I describe myself as working in computer science. And there's that word science there. And I sometimes feel guilty that I'm not doing enough science in terms of forming hypotheses and running experiments, and above all else, drawing graphs. So here's a graph. And th th this graph is going to represent a theory that I think most programmers out there implicitly follow. Uh, on the y-axis, I'll put throughput, or some measure of the performance of a web application. And apparently, on the x-axis, the idea is that the more Greek letters appear in your language's reference manual, the worse the performance has to be. So let's run an experiment to test this theory. And so we can look at the results of this web framework performance comparison. And uh, I'll show you what the most recent results of, are for comparing about 150 different frameworks. And here they are. We have Urweb placing roughly second out of 150 frameworks. Uh, there are several different tests. This is just one of them. And we can see Urweb gets to about 300,000 requests served per second for the, the source code I showed you on the screen before. There is this one C++ implementation that just barely beats out Urweb, which is kind of a bummer. But also, if I didn't have that there, you would probably think these numbers were fudged if no one could do better using C++. <laughs> At the same time, there are a few other C++ frameworks that do considerably worse than Urweb, which is also interesting. 
And if we look way down this list, we can find Node.js achieving roughly one-fifth of the performance of the, the highest performance solution. So we can all take a moment to laugh smugly at those poor mainstream programmers using their untyped scripting language here. And then we can look a little further down, and we can find the one entry using Haskell, <laughs> which, which is an order of magnitude off from the, from the performance of the best entry. So, I expect at least one person in the audience to get started on fixing this immediately and let me know the results in the questions at the end of my talk. <laughs> but while you're working on that, I'll talk, talk about how this compiler works and how we get from a purely functional language down to code that is very competitive with C code. And the, the subtitle for this part of the talk is You Can Do This at Home. I'm going to describe a pretty simple compilation strategy that works very well to bridge the gap from a very high level of abstraction down to extremely performant low-level code. But it isn't a general purpose language kind of approach. It's a, it takes advantage of the fact that this is a domain-specific language where we know what these things in the standard library really mean, and we can build optimizations that are specialized to things like SQL and HTML. So the most important decision in this compiler architecture is to make it a whole program optimizing compiler. And I was inspired in this choice by the Milton compiler for standard ML. Basically, after we type check all the source code for your program, including all the libraries, we are going to smash all the abstraction barriers, inline a lot of higher order features so that the program gets to be a lot more first order and it's much more practical to do program analysis and optimization. So here again is the, the program that we started from. This is the one that generated the performance results I showed you. It's a, a fairly simple one. It, it declares a particular SQL table and down here is a function that's going to be called whenever a web request comes in. And it generates the page to show to the, the user. And we query out of the database all the rows of this table. Then we concatenate a, a new element onto the list of rows that we got and do an in-memory sort with a particular comparison. And then we build an HTML page here, which generates a, a visual table that shows what we got out of this sorting operation. So on the road to compiling this to efficient code, we're going to start out with several stages that are basically specializing definitions in that program. So for instance, if we look at the sorting operation that appeared in there, it's defined in terms of a standard algebraic data type for lists, which is polymorphic in the type of data. And we have a polymorphic sorting function in the standard library. So we notice that this sorting function takes a type parameter, but at this particular use of it, we know what that parameter is. So we could build a specialized version just for the type that we use here. And I'll call that type capital T. So we get sort prime, which is specialized to capital T. Then we have a use of the general list type applied to a particular type parameter. Let's also specialize a particular version of the list algebraic data type, and I'll call that list prime, and it has T every place we had the type parameter A before. And finally, we'll notice that sort prime is called with a particular function argument at this use point here. Let's specialize the library function to that particular choice of arguments, and that, that might even enable other optimizations. And we get to a form like this, where we have sort double prime that works directly on list prime. And this code is actually really straightforward to translate directly to idiomatic C code and realize all the, the performance benefits that we would expect from that style. So the compiler does this automatically throughout the program. And then we get to code like this, which is building HTML. And the, the source code looks like this, that it's bits of normal HTML syntax intermixed with computations that construct HTML trees programmatically. But actually, the compiler's parser desugars this into calls to combinators from the standard library that stand for all the features of HTML. So we have combinators for tags, combinators for concatenating together HTML fragments, one for lifting a string into an HTML fragment. And after we do this, what we're going to do is the next phase of compilation is going to translate to a monomorphic language because the earlier phases got rid of all the polymorphism. And while we do that, we will inline the definitions of these combinators, revealing that HTML trees are actually just strings. And here's how you build them in each case. For instance, the tag for a table heading is just a, a lambda that takes in the contents of this tag and then concatenates the open and closed tags for th around it. So when we fill in these definitions, we get code like this, which is a tree of string concatenations and escaping operations and things like that. This is closer to what we know how to actually execute, but it's also wasteful if we interpret this directly in the way that a functional language usually would. 
So we'll run a phase of algebraic simplification that knows about the properties of string operations, and it'll turn into more like this, where we've reconstructed the literal HTML at the beginning. Now it's a string literal instead of a, a strongly typed tree for HTML, and we have a, a map operation over a list to produce some other HTML. Actually, the, the phase that produced this code brought us to our first imperative intermediate language. So we're going to build this HTML tree as a string and then call a write operation that imperatively sends it over to the client. Actually, it appends into a buffer. And after the page generation is finished, we send the buffer contents. So we might notice here, what we're doing is concatenating two strings and then writing the results to the user. This seems wasteful because we probably allocate an intermediate string for this concatenation. So we can use an algebraic optimization that finds that if you have a write of a concatenation, you can replace it with two different writes of the two things you're concatenating. So this is a good start. We can do better if we look at the definition of this mapx function, which is parameterized over some function f. And we know that an earlier phase of the compiler is going to specialize mapx to the particular function we passed it. So we get code like this, which is a recursive function specialized to generating this HTML table. And now what we can notice is that we, we call it mapx prime and then immediately write the results into this buffer we're accumulating. And so we can do a fusion optimization to push the write operation inside the definition of mapx prime and avoid some intermediate allocations. So write pops into each of these two cases of the pattern match. And then we can do some more algebraic simplification, where in the second case, where currently it says write the results of this big string concatenation, we'll replace that with a sequence of write operations. And now the recursive call to mapx double prime is a tail call for this imperative operation. And we've reached the point where this code involves zero allocation in the usual sense. Everything it does is just appending to this big string buffer, and it's extremely efficient. So I should say some more about the, the memory allocation model that Urweb uses. In general, we have a set of threads running, which are worker threads that handle requests for pages from the browsers out there. And each thread has its own private buffer to receive pieces of the page that are being written. And it also has its own completely private heap. The only shared mutable state between the threads is in the SQL database, which is accessed in a very stylized way. We do have the C malloc heap here off to the side, which we use occasionally when we realize, say, this heap here might be too small. We need more space. So the, the program realizes we need to allocate more heap stuff. And so what it's going to do is reallocate a new heap of twice the size of the original. And we'll get that by pulling from the, the malloc heap. But this is not the common case. Since we double the size each time, this doesn't happen too frequently. And in the, the common case, the fast path for this code involves zero shared memory between the different worker threads, which is highly compatible with what you need to do to optimize the cache performance of memory systems for multi-cores. It might also seem like that looks too easy to work in practice, because when we grow the heap to twice its original size, we probably have a heap at a new address compared to the old one, and we need to fix up some pointers internally within the heap. But Urweb does something different from that. Uh, transactions are integrated deeply into the semantics of the language. So at any point, we are ready to roll back all side effects and restart the execution of the transaction. So when we run out of heap space, we just blow away the current transaction, double the heap size, and start over again. So this saves us from having to spend any extra memory space on data structures that support garbage collection. And the compiler does some extra static analysis that infers other points in the execution where it's possible to free some of the memory early. So in, in summary, I've told you about a simple compilation strategy for taking very high-level code and turning it into very efficient low-level code. And it's, it's simple because the compiler that Urweb uses doesn't have any data flow analysis. It doesn't use any control flow analysis. There's no garbage collector or any of the other most common runtime system features that we're used to from functional languages. The compiler does work by generating C code, which goes into DCC and then provides some of these features. But if you wanted to apply this recipe to your functional DSL, you wouldn't have to re-implement any of these things yourself. So I think it's a very practical choice for, for that kind of implementation. So I'll just finish with this URL to the Urweb project. I'd encourage you to take a look and consider using it in your next web application. And I'd love to hear about experiences trying that. Thank you. Uh-huh. 
So, Adam, I, I'd like to answer uh, what's going on with those benchmarks, which, if you look at them, are highly variable. And, and since you talked about real-world problems, you get a very real-world answer, which is disappointing. Um, the analogy is there was the computer language benchmarks game back in the day, and sure. people discovered the regex benchmark actually didn't test your language. It tested two things, the efficiency of your FFI calls and the quality of the underlying regex library you bound to. In these benchmarks, what we find they're testing is the quality of your database binding and uh, the quality of alternately your um, HTML templating or your JSON serialization library. So most of the variability isn't from the quality of the language. It's from the quality of uh, these various libraries and the efficiency of FFI calls uh, between them. And it does show that uh, Haskell's database bindings tend to be sort of abysmal performance-wise. So someone should get on that. OK, thanks. <laughs> So one of the things that people like to do in web application development is to separate some of the things that you've put into the same program, so like the HTML code so that a designer can work on it while the, back, the application programmer works on the backend code. Is it possible to combine the kinds of programming style things that people like to get in modern web application frameworks with the optimization potential that you showed here? It's easy to implement that kind of separation of concerns just by splitting your code into separate libraries that happen to follow uh, common patterns for splitting across different source languages in mainstream frameworks. And then the compiler comes along and inlines everything and you get back to the, the same code and the same performance. Uh, sure, if you have all your HTML at program, at compilation time for the program, but Often the reason people use separate templates is so they can change them without changing the program. So do you think there's a way to get some of the sort of later uh, choices about HTML generation while still getting these performance benefits? I think to some extent it's a religious question about how much you mind spending a few seconds recompiling after you make a change. But if you don't mind that, then you, you would rerun the compiler each time you change the HTML. But it's not that big a deal, and Urweb caches some of the, the cost of compilation so that the actual program code doesn't get recompiled fully. So it, it works pretty well in practice, I think. So when you inline everything, do you blow up any kind of code size, or do you ever have to say, you know, this is recursive, I better stop, something like that? So the compiler never inlines recursive definitions. It, and there are heuristics about choosing when to inline other things. It always inlines polymorphic definitions because we, some intermediate languages don't support polymorphism. And there are other heuristics like that. Thanks. Thanks.